All right. I think I'll start this morning with some prayer. Lord God, I just thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for your faithfulness to David and Nicole. We're so pleased that he's feeling better and he's come through this um, problem with his hips. Um, we praise you, God, for being present with them and for bringing healing. Um, I ask now, Lord, that you'd be with us as we um, gather together around your word. I pray that um, our hearts will be receptive to, receptive to hear what you want to say to us this morning. In your mighty name, amen. Okay, well, at the start of um, my sermon series, you know, we're doing um, on the spiritual disciplines. I said how invaluable these practices can be for our faith journeys. The reason they are so invaluable is because they provide us with a mechanism through which we can reason and seek God on the things of life that may challenge us. Then through them, God can guide us in a way ahead, especially when the way ahead is not often visible or clear to us. Spiritual disciplines like prayer and Sabbath give us comfort and permission to rest in our God. Self-denial and fasting give us reason to pause, to adjust our perspectives, turn our eyes to Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, and to see him as the rightful provider of all our needs. Now, last week, we began a discussion about the up-and-coming traffic light system. In many respects, we're finding ourselves in a horrible time of life, having to make decisions about things we never thought we would have to make. There are grave concerns on both sides of the spectrum. There are equally valid and competing questions for both the vaccinated and the unvaccinated in our church. Now, before either side decides to lynch me for saying that, <laughs> can I ask that you just sit with a spirit of calm and empathy and compassion and a willingness to see what God might be saying to all of us here in his church. You have the right to feel safe and protected, particularly if your health is vulnerable or you're protecting a vulnerable person in your family. I stand with you. You also have every right to have uh, your safety concerns about the vaccine heard, to have your questions answered before you decide you're going to get it, or to have your moral objections to the use of aborted fetal cells in vaccine testing and production acknowledged without being called a conspiracy theorist or some kind of crazy, crazy person. I stand with you. I stand with you all because God has given us all free will to make our own decisions. But I also know it's equally important to realize that he also calls us to account to make sure that we exercise our free will without harm to others. I also know that our true enemy is Satan, and COVID is really a symptom he is happily using to bring suffering to an already fallen world. I also know that the situation we find ourselves in is ever-evolving and ever-changing. There are benefits and consequences no matter where you seem to find yourself on the spectrum, earthly and heavenly. To all of you, whichever side you are on, I hear you, I hear your fears, I hear your frustrations, I hear your concerns, and I stand with you. We, we may end up being on the same page, we may not. Don't be shocked if that doesn't happen. The decision you make may be shocking for some, um, it works both ways. I care about how you're feeling, the worry you have, the hurt you are carrying. I'm experiencing those things too. I will say I've been intentional about not saying what my decision was because I don't want to unduly influence anyone here to make a decision. 
um, that um, you don't want to make or you cannot make or you feel uncomfortable with because you somehow respect and value my judgment. I want you above all to be influenced by God in your decision making. As your shepherd, I've been praying that you would make the right decision for you and your family and that I am making the right decision for me and my family. I want the decision to be led by God because when you can stand before God with a clear conscience, knowing you have done all he has asked you to, that is a marvelous thing. Despite all this, it can at times feel like we're between a rock and a hard place. How can we maintain unity? How can we make um, hard decisions that need to be made when it concerns people who we love and know in this very room? Now, I'm not going to answer those questions today, and, and neither should you, because I think we have some work to do yet before we get to that stage. But what I want to do is turn to a spiritual discipline, something that Jesus practiced regularly. As we unpack the spiritual teaching, I'm hoping that it will set us all on a solid foundation and give us the wisdom as we attempt to part the Red Sea, as it were, and cross to the other side. Let me also say it's not and has never been my intention to make anyone feel condemned in their decision making or guilty over any actions they may have or have not taken. What I desire above all else this morning is that we listen to the gentle whisper of God and allow him to lead us together through this. I want each one of us to respond in obedience to his or her call whatever that might be, and respect the fact that that might for others look a bit different. We need to discern with wisdom the situation before us and not rush to judgment too quickly. Okay, so the spiritual discipline I want us to look at is submission. Now, submission is not agreeing to do something that is morally wrong. Let's get that straight. Submission in the biblical sense is about navigating life through the lens of Jesus' teachings and with a mind to loving others, to putting others first above our own needs as he commanded. And I'm sure as you are listening, you're saying, if only it were that simple, Laurie. And of course you're right, it's not. <laughs> Submission is complex. Submission utilized in the church in the past, as Foster says, has not always been done right or taught well. It has been destructive at times. It has been used incorrectly in the past to keep people in bondage and bearing a heavy burden. And it has been thought of as having no importance and resulted in less than adequate discipleship and people not being challenged to mature in the faith. So, what are the markers of good biblical submission? How can we discern that submission is firstly godly? Well, most of us would look at the outward actions of someone and make a judgment call. We become onlookers. A commentator once said, this is not how God works. God is not an onlooker, but an inlooker. What does that mean? Well, last week we spoke about the Sabbath. From the outside, the Pharisees and Jesus both celebrated the Sabbath. But the Pharisees condemned Jesus' practice of it. They assumed that there was ill will behind Jesus' Sabbath keeping. But Jesus, being God, could show them their hypocrisy their heart's motivation meant that their outward action, while in line with what looked like Sabbath, completely missed the point. God looks at the heart. God is an inlooker, not an outlooker. And so God is the only one who can really establish whether the heart of a person is well-intentioned or not. 
this is why we must not be quick to judge. Proverbs 16 verse 2 says, All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. So let's unpack submission now that the context has been laid for us. Foster writes, Almost all church fights and splits occur because people do not have the freedom to give in to each other. We insist that a critical issue is at stake. We are fighting for a sacred principle. Perhaps this is the case. Usually, it is not. Often we can't stand to give in simply because it means we will not get our own way. Only in submission are we enabled to bring the spirit to a place where it no longer controls us. Only submission can free us significantly to enable us to distinguish between genuine issues and stubborn self-will. Foster continues, the biblical teaching on submission focuses primarily on the spirit in which we view other people. What he is saying is that in Scripture, when God speaks of relationships, he does not see one party having hierarchy over another. Rather, each party has a role to play in submitting to the other. Take slaves and masters, for example. I'm sure each one of us has been on either side of that metaphorical equation. The Bible begins by saying, slaves, submit to your masters. Why in this submission is it so important when slavery is so clearly wrong? Well, Jesus is speaking about something deeper, or Paul is speaking through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about something deeper. While Foster says, outwardly we can do what people ask, inwardly there can be rebellion in us against them. An onlooker might say, all is well, when in fact God says as an inlooker, there's an attitude of heart there that doesn't line up with the teachings of God. God sees bitterness growing, injustice there, and knew that the only way he could remedy, um, sorry, I've lost my place. He could remedy that is if through Paul's inspired instruction, the slave showed unconditional love and grace in the face of injustice so that the master's heart could be convicted and change and seek God too. Now, if that is where God left it, we would say the slave would have been without hope. But in fact, God has something to say to the masters as well. In Ephesians, we read, Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. And there we have it, a wonderful example of a spiritual discipline of submission, bringing life in the midst of a hard-to-navigate cultural dynamic. Okay, so let's recap. What is submission? The spiritual discipline of submission has two aspects, submission to God and submission to others. Let's start with submission to God. So how does the rule of God work in our lives? In Mark 8.34, Jesus says, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In Matthew 10, 38 to 40, he also says, Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. What we have learned from this is that submission to God brings both freedom and limitation. We limit our ways to find freedom and life in his ways. Sometimes our desires line up with God, and that's good. We are affirmed 
in our freedom. Sometimes our desires do not, and then we can find that God's ways limit us, but it's for our good. We exhibit obedience and trust that God's ways are better than our ways, and we, by his spirit, change. We reap the fruits to submitting to Christ and realize that God's limitation is good and proper and right. It is then through the lens of Jesus' teachings that we can navigate the difficult and bumpy road to mutual submission. Sometimes submission to others comes easy, sometimes it does not. If we share the same views, submission comes easy. If we are on opposing ends, it can be hard. But from what we've been learning, all is not always what it seems. We need to switch from onlookers to inlookers like Jesus. Just because people agree doesn't make it right. Likewise, just because people don't doesn't make it wrong. What matters is that at the core of our mutual submission is a willingness to all place God's ways above our own. So submission as God intended it brings freedom and limitations. This is when it comes time to act. Now Foster speaks of a number of actions uh, related to submission and he lists them in order. The first one is the act and submission to our triune God, which we've discussed already. The next, number two, is an act of submission to scripture. We yield ourselves, he says, first to hear the word. That's Jesus and the Bible. Second, to receive it, and third, to obey it. We look to the spirit who inspired it to interpret it and apply it in our lives. Thirdly comes the act of submission to our family, where he says we look not only to our interests, but to the interests of others. We make allowances for each other. This is how God's relationships will thrive and be fruitful. Number four, the act of submission to our neighbors and those we meet in daily life. Foster says, we perform small acts of kindness or ordinary neighborliness. Number five, the act of submission to the believing community. Foster says, if there are jobs to be done and tasks to accomplish, we look at them closely to see if they are God's invitation to the cross life. We can't do everything, Foster says, but we can do some things. As we navigate our next step, can we be inlookers of our hearts and then the hearts of others? Can we see God at work there? Can we live in submission to each other for his sake so that the hands can be hands and the nose can be a nose, remember the body of Christ, our submission to God might differ given the circumstances we find ourselves in life. And if they are both right before God, can we trust him to unite our submission to each other as we individually seek to submit to him first? Submission to the will of God must always motivate our submission to others. Number six, the act of submission to the broken and despised. Foster writes, in culture, there are the widows and the orphans, the helpless and the undefended. Our first responsibility is to be among him, among them, he says. We must discover ways to identify genuinely with the downtrodden and the rejected. There we must live the cross life too. The last act of, act of submission is to the world. We must be his salt and light to the world and live under the authority of those in leadership over us. 
Now, the teaching on authority in the Bible and our submission to this is also based on freedom and limitations. What makes authority in the world good is when it lines up with spiritual authority, God's authority. As the people of God, we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to discern whether the authority in the world is operating in line with what God's ways are or not. If they are, then we will find freedom and good in our submission to them. Great good can come from human institutions whose authority mirrors the principles of God. Foster says, likewise, if human authority is running contrary to God's ways, then we have the spiritual authority to discern that, and we're directed by God to limit our submission to worldly authority because we not acknowledge God's rulership as supreme in our lives. So, as you can see, submission is an amazing gift of God to our lives. It helps us to navigate the many and varied aspects of our lives. So can I encourage you to take this teaching and apply it to your thinking and dealings as we move ahead in some very difficult and complex decision making? Can we not jump to conclusions? Can we not be onlookers? If a person's position is different to yours, try to be an inlooker for the Lord's sake. Ask yourself, can I stand before God with my decision making and know that I am in submission to him and in submission to others? That is always a good place to start. Is there anything about my decision or outlook that I would be challenged on as I stand before God? That might involve a repentance or a change. God will lead us. Can you look into the heart of the other with spiritual discernment that God has equipped you with and see that what is going on there is of God, even if it looks different? Can I do my bit in submission? Remember, Foster says you don't have to do everything, but we all can do something. Can we see God's masterpiece being woven together as each one of us seeks and submits to the Lord wholeheartedly and stand united together? Let's pray. Lord God, I truly believe that when we are faced with some of the most difficult situations in life, that your word speaks to us. It calls to us, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you give each and every one of us discernment? Would you help us not to rush to judgment? Would you help us to be inlookers? Would you help us to discern the way ahead, Lord God, as we face very difficult decisions in the near future? Unite us, Lord God. Do not let these things that are happening around us cause disunity amongst us. We all have you in common, Lord Jesus. And we love each other here in this church. And so I ask, by your mighty spirit, would you lead and guide us across that Red Sea? Would you part the waters, God? Would you take us to the other side safely? Fear is quite present among us. Differing opinions are present among us. But can we find in the midst of that hardship the wonders of your kingdom life that calls us to sacrifice for others and also calls us to love others? Um, I pray this in your name over this church, over our community. We pray for the healing of our land, Lord God. We know that you have power to do that. So we pray for this uh, massive healing for COVID, Lord Jesus, around the world. We pray for more and more medical treatments to be made 
uh, available. We pray for uh, medicine that is needed by poorer countries, Lord God, to be uh, met. Um, I pray that we as your church will be on the front lines seeking justice for people, seeking just for those that lack. I pray that we would be your people united together. I pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you.